All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to Codex. Uh, Kaso Akujo is a professor of mathematics at Tufts University. In 2003, he received a PhD in math from Georgia Tech under the direction of Chris Heil. Until recently, he was a professor at the University of Maryland and member of the Norbert Wiener Center for Harmonic Analysis and Applications. Over the last two decades, Professor Akujo has made several important contributions to the field, having studied Gabor frames, scalable frames, and modulation spaces. In fact, you can now purchase his book on modulation spaces as part of Springer's book series on applied and numerical harmonic analysis. In today's talk, Professor Akujo will discuss some of his recent work on the optimization of frames, specifically universal minimizers of P frame potentials. All right, take it away. Thank you very much, Justin and uh, Joey, John and Emily for the opportunity to give a talk here. Uh, thank you for the advertisement of your book. Uh, you should keep doing that. Okay. And, uh, so today I would like to talk about um, the work I've been doing um, over the last few years uh, with some of the undergraduate students who were part of uh, our REU in Maryland. So Eric Goodman and uh, Victor Gonzalez, uh, as well as work that I've done previously with Martin Erler and uh, recently uh, Shumei, and, uh, Shumei Chen and uh, Shuji Ken, who is uh, a joint student of uh, John and myself, uh, work on this topic as well. And uh, I've been discussing some numerical aspect of the work with uh, a colleague from Israel, uh, Radel Ben Av, and I'll mention some of the things that we, we 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 did together or we're doing together uh, in the in the during the talk. All right. So the outline of my presentation is uh, I'd like to recall what a p-frame potential is or are. And I want to focus on the topic of uh, universal optimal configuration for the p-frame potential. So by that, I mean uh, a subset of, of the units here that seem to provide like an optimal uh, solution to a family of minimization problem. And in this particular case, it's going to be like the optimization of uh, p-frame potentials. Um, and uh, it turns out that we don't know too much about uh, this, uh, this optimizer in general. And even in dimension two, uh, not much is known. We've made some progress recently and uh, there are still some very, uh, what I'd say, like um, easy to state problem, but uh, to my knowledge, they are still very difficult to solve. So I'll mention a few of these in uh, during the talk. All right, so the, the problem that I want to consider uh, can be described as uh, in two different ways. So one way is uh, uh, a family of discrete potential, and that's the one that I wrote in the, on, this, on this line here. So I'll take a finite set on the units here in D dimension Euclidean space, and uh, I'll take a function right now. I'm not specifying anything about the function. I'll do so as we go along. I'll take a function and I'll consider like a discrete potential that's the sum over all the entry or all the vector in my collection. And the function is a function of the inner product of uh, vectors uh, in that set. So you can view this as sort of a distance of the shear. That's, that's what this is going to be. Uh, I have a normalization factor here that I can um, I like to sort of uh, keep. Sometime I'm going to drop the normalization factor. So this is just like the number of points that I have in my set. Now this can be seen as an approximation to a different object, which is uh, the one that I have down here, which will sort of uh, be defined on the set of uh, probability measure on uh, the sphere. And uh, it's exactly the same function, except that here I'm looking at uh, a, a functional that act on, uh, on a measure rather than on, uh, on a discrete point but we can see the connection between the two because uh, if I take like a set of points and I, come, I, I, I look at the discrete measure that they, they form, then I can go back to the discrete setting. So the problem that I want to solve is going to be focused essentially on the discrete potential, but I'm going to want in a while make a connection to the, 
problem about like the continuous case and uh, try to sort of go back and forth between the two. Now, the model result that I would like to, to keep in mind and I want you to keep in mind is uh, this theorem by Kohn and Kuma in 2007. And I'm not going to define all the terminology here. Uh, it says that for a family of a function and these functions are known as a completely monotonic function, what this means, it just means that the function are C infinity and uh, they change derivative. So the function is positive, the derivative is negative, the second derivative is positive and so forth. And that's what this completely monotonic function means. Uh, and uh, if C is a finite set of a unit here and uh, the cardinality of C is a big N, uh, and C is what's known as a sharp configuration. So sharp configuration uh, mean that uh, there are N distant inner product uh, in the set and the set form what's known as a 2M minus one uh, spherical design. So if you were here last time for, I think Matt talk last week or two weeks ago, and a few of our talks actually mentioned like the notion of spherical uh, uh, design. And uh, this is one of the spherical design that, um, uh, that has like very few inner product essentially. So if this is the case, then the, this set C is actually an optimal configuration, meaning that it's a minimizer of this family of potential. So F is arbitrarily completely monotonic function. And as long as I can put my hand on this uh, sharp configuration, then I know that I can sort of use it to minimize this entire family of functional. And that's the type of result that I'm going to try to see if we can get when we specify the function f to not be completely monotonic. In fact, we're going to be slightly away from that, but we're going to be like a function that's, uh, that's uh, going to give rise to the p-frame potential. So the result that I want to sort of uh, have you keep in mind is exactly this one. And when I say that I want something to be universal, I mean I want a set that can give me like a, a minimizer for an entire class of uh, functional. And uh, this is going to be the model that we're going to keep in mind. All right, so specifically, I'm interested in the p-frame potential. So the p-frame potential is defined for parameter p, which can be any number between zero and infinity, infinity included and is defined as the sum of the inner product of uh, vectors uh, raised to the power p. So here for, so I'm not going to sort of be very consistent. Some of the results that I'm going to state are going to be stated without the diagonal term. So here I sort of look at uh, the case, k is equal to L, but some of the result will actually be exactly with this one. So there is no big difference between the two. So when I write like fp, uh, I have to keep in mind what are the parameter here. P is what I'm interested in. I can think about it as a strength of my potential. And uh, N is a number of a vector in my set and D is an ambient dimension of the space I'm working on. Uh, the broad question that I want to look at, uh, what are the minimizer of this uh, family? And more importantly, uh, I would like to be able to describe what the, the minimizer are. So, uh, as a function of P, as a function of N, as a function of D, is what do they have that's interesting to sort of investigate. But more importantly, I want to see if they are set that seem to sort of be universal minimizer for this family and for which rank, for which dimension, and for which number of points. So the problem we want to address is a problem involving the p-frame potential, which are defined this way. And uh, the key question that we want to look at are the minimizer, uh, description of a minimum value and uh, whether or not uh, we know a set that are going to give rise to universal optimizer for this family. Now, it turns out that uh, you can look at this in the continuous domain as well. And uh, in the continuous domain, uh, what you have is uh, the notion of a probabilistic p-frame potential, which Martin Euler and I, we, uh, we start looking at in 2012. Uh, it's defined exactly the same way I defined previously, except that I'm looking at measure, probability measure that are defined on the shear, uh, unit shear in um, D dimension. And uh, it's defined exactly through this, this formula over here. Uh, there have been some recent interest uh, by a number of people, especially Bilik, uh, Glazrain, and um, their collaborator. They've looked at in a series of papers of uh, minimizer of this uh, potential. And uh, they actually made a very interesting conjecture, which is to say that uh, for any dimension greater or equal to two, 
And for any P positive, as long as P is not like an even integer, then the minimizer of this potential are always going to be discrete measures. Um, uh, this is something interesting that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, it turns out that in, uh, in 2012, Ma uh, Martin and I, we actually proved that this was the case as long as you restrict uh, P to be between zero and two. And so uh, Bilik and his collaborators sort of uh, put this uh, in a broader sort of uh, uh, contest and think that this should be the case. And at the very minimum, what they actually were able to prove, they proved that uh, the, the minimizer are somehow like small in the sense that uh, the support of the measure that the minimizer uh, should have empty interior. But they have not been able to establish like uh, the, the fact that this is uh, discrete in, uh, in this generality. So I'm going to come back to this uh, conjecture in a minute. But again, my focus will be on the discrete case, but I'm going to time to time refer to the continuous case for an analogy and think that you can sort of transfer back and forth between the two. So I can't see the chat. So if there's any question, I hope uh, Dustin or John or Joey can sort of let me know. All right, so this object of the P-frame potential are not completely unknown to us. For people working in frame theory, this uh, object that we've seen before, uh, the case P equal to, which actually uh, uh, gave rise to the name uh, frame potential, uh, as all of us know, was uh, uh, the work by John and uh, Matt Fickers, who proved that in the case P equal to two, uh, the minimizer of this, as long as n is greater or equal to two, are exactly the uh, front TF, uh, the finite unit, unit norm tight frames. And uh, we know a lot about this. We know a lot about the theory. In particular, we know that local minimizer are actually global minimizers, and uh, we know how to construct them. Uh, uh, there's a bunch of uh, work, especially by Dustin, Matt, uh, Jameson, Nate, and they gave a pretty nice description of uh, how to construct like a uh, font TF in, in general. So this is ve very well known. Uh, the other case that's quite well known is uh, P is equal to four, or uh, in fact, any even number. These are related to spherical uh, design. Uh, the, they were mentioned a lot like uh, for the last two weeks in the talk by uh, Matt and also by uh, uh, Marcus. And uh, the sick P of VM problem is also related to somehow to the case of P is equal to four. And P equal infinity is uh, the case where we look at uh, the, co uh, the coherence of a system of vector. And in that case, we know the Welsh bound provide a lower bound, but uh, as uh, has been brought to, to the community by the work of uh, Boston, Matt, Joey, and uh, John and Emily and others, there are other sort of uh, lower bound for this that, that are interesting in their own right. But I'm just sort of sticking to this because this is the one directly related to what I would like to, to talk about. So the nice thing about this is that we know when the equality is met here, it's met exactly when we have like a few angular type frame. So I'm not going to define a frame. I'm assuming that everyone knows this. So if a frame is just like a spanning set if you, if you want to sort of think about it that way. And a few angular and tight just mean that uh, they are like possible frame that give you like almost like a possible, uh, exactly a possible type equality, uh, equation. But then the angle between any two vectors is exactly a constant. And uh, there is a restriction on the number of points that you can have to have this happen. And uh, in, the, in the real case, which I'm mostly dealing with, the number of points cannot be, cannot be more than d multiplied by d plus one over two. So in that regime, you hope you can get an equiangular tight frame. You don't know if they exist, but if they do exist, then n must be less or equal to that number. When you're above that number, then the minimizer are, uh, are called Grassmannian frame. I think the term was coined by, I believe, John, or maybe um, the, the fact that the minimizer I called Grassmannian was first uh, appear in a paper by John and Joe Colsa, I believe, or by uh, uh, Stomer and Heath. Uh, I'm not sure where sort of uh, this name appeared the first time, but that's, that's what they are called. So the infinity norm, uh, when it's minimized, uh, and uh, in the case where I'm not in the regime of equiangular, they are going to be known as Grassmannian frames. Okay. All right, so to begin with, what I would like to do is uh, to 
tell you a little bit about the general property of the minimizer of a p-frame potential as a function of p n and the n essentially the dimension i'll keep it most of the time constant so the first thing is that the minimizer of a p-frame potential if n is greater or equal to two is always a frame so no what this means that is that if you put your hand on a minimizer you know that it has to spend the entire space it's not spending like a subset or a subspace but the entire space so that's the first thing uh, the other thing is that the infinity norm of the infinity potential can be seen as a limit as p goes to infinity of a p1. Uh, this is not too surprising. Uh, what is also interesting is that if I take a sequence, if I pick a minimizer for each of these p and I take a cluster point of this set of minimizers, then the, that cluster point will be a minimizer of the infinity norm of the infinity potential. So that's also not too surprising. Uh, the other thing is that as a function of p, it's a continuous function, non-increasing. So we know the general shape of the function, it should sort of be going down. And the last uh, result uh, tells me that uh, as a function of n, uh, this scale approximately like uh, uh, n square, like it's a quadratic in, in terms of uh, the number of points. And this is not our result. So this was a result proved already by PKT, I believe and that you can find in, um, in paper or book on um, discrete energy minimizers. So these are the generic thing that I feel like uh, want you to sort of keep in mind as you're working and uh, which will be helpful when you're trying to sort of see how to compare one to, to the other. So this was uh, obtained by uh, Shume, Eric, uh, and Victor and myself uh recently i think i skip a name here which is pretty bad i think this is also this paper also include uh uh shuji so this will be bad because i think i copy this a few times so keep that in mind i'm sorry about that so shuji. all right so the first thing i want to highlight is uh the, uh, the search for this optimal configuration that are uh, universal. And the first result was uh, a result that I obtained with uh, Martin in 2012, which says that if I take P greater than two, and uh, if I look at, if uh, the, the P frame potential is minimized by, an, is, sorry, for any P bigger than two, the P frame potential is minimized by an ETF when they exist. So we don't know if ETF exists in general, but when they do exist for P bigger than two, then they're going to provide the minimizer for the P frame potential. In particular, for, N plus, for D plus one point in dimension D, I know I can always construct an ETF, which, which I call the simplest ETF. In this case, I know exactly that for all P bigger than two, this is going to provide me the minimizer of the P frame potential. So I already have here an instance of a universal set, right? an ETF of T plus one point in any dimension D will be a minimizer for all P bigger than two. And I believe in fact that this should be, uh, this is a unique minimizer. So here, when I talk about unique minimizer, I want to sort of think about uh, like a modulo, like uh, the obvious, like, uh, how do I call them? The obvious like uh, symmetry. So I can flip a vector, I can sort of do rotation. So if you take those out, then this is what I sort of going to say that these are unique, okay. So in dimension two in particular, we, we were able to completely sort of uh, settle the question of a minimizer of a p-frame potential. So here I want you to keep in mind, p is a variable here. I'm facing three points and I'm working only in dimension two. I know that I can always construct like uh, uh, the Mercedes Benz frame is uh, on the simplest ETF and it provides a minimizer for, for p bigger than two. So from two to infinity, it's a minimizer. But it turns out that it's also a minimizer all the way to a value that's very close to, I mean, uh, less than two. And that value is log three over log two. And uh, between zero and log three over log two, uh, a set that we call ONB plus, which is just an orthonormal basis, plus one of your the vector repeated. So you just repeat one of the two vector in your orthonormal basis, and that provides the minimizer. So here we have like, a, uh, as a function of P, this, has only two family of minimizer. One, which is your phenomenal basis with uh, uh, one vector repeated, and the other one is just the ETF of the Mercedes space in three dimension. So this was actually the start of uh, what Martin and I were hoping to do for NED. So we were thinking if I have four points in uh, three dimension or five points in four dimension, then the shape of this function should be essentially the same. And we set out to prove it and we couldn't until uh, when Eric and Victor were working for the REU, 
they came up with this interesting picture that I'm going to spend some time talking about. I, I presented this like, uh, I believe a couple of years ago. It's still probably like on um, Dustin uh, blog. And at the time, I think I promised like maybe a beer for whoever is going to be able to prove it. So, so you owe somebody like beer, I'll tell you who. Uh, you've probably seen the paper already, but this has been now settled and uh, completely proved. So the graph that I'm showing here is uh, a function as a function of P and the function is the minimizer of mu P as I'm increasing the dimension. So here, this is dimension two. It's just in this case, it's just a graph that I have over here that I sort of uh, drag a little bit longer. So there is a value P1 where the minimizer is what I call ONB plus. So it's an orthonormal basis plus one over the vector repeated. And from that point on, all the way to infinity, then the ETF in two dimension, uh, uh, which is just a Mercedes-Benz frame is a minimizer here. So what happened next was that we were thinking that the graph should always look exactly like this, would go down exactly the same way. But it turns out that something very interesting happened. So between zero and this value P1 that I just described earlier, the minimizer is exactly ONB plus. So meaning that you just take your orthonormal basis, you repeat any one of the vector, then it's going to provide you the minimizer for all the P that are in this range. The way you can view it is actually for a lifting process. So what you're really doing is taking the vector, the minimizer that you have in three dimension, in two dimension, and you just inject this into three dimensions. So you have like one, zero, one, zero, zero, one. If you inject this three vector in dimension, uh, in dimension three, and you add the missing vector to make an orthonormal basis, you just get exactly what you call like uh, ONB plus in the next dimension. And you keep doing this process all the way, and then you're going to get all the minimizer in this, in this range. Now, the interesting thing happened in the, in the range that goes from P1 to a value that Martin and I never sort of consider, which is you take the ETF of a Mercedes Benz in dimension three and you do the same process. You inject it in one dimension and that will provide a minimizer all the way to a new cutting point and that a value P2, that's about 1.7. And then from there, this is still going to sort of be the same process will generate the minimizer all the way to uh, NED. And the same phenomenon is going to happen when you go to the next dimension, you have to lift up the new minimizer that you get is going to provide you all the way here. And then the next thing you sort of keep doing this all the way to two, where the, mess, uh, the ETF of uh, D plus one vector in D dimension will be the minimizer for infinity. So we have this for about, uh, about three or four years. We thought this was, uh, uh, this was true, but we didn't know how to prove it. Uh, I believe the first person who got like uh, started was uh, Alexei Glazirin, who proved that uh, for some range between zero and a little bit about 1.5, what we thought was true. He wasn't able to completely do this. And uh, Shuji actually in her thesis was able to extend this for some large value of D. And uh, while we were working on that, we got like, uh, the, the, there was a paper posted on the archive that completely settled this, this problem. And the method, you can view it as somehow like a very refined version of the linear programming bound. That essentially what sort of gave this solution. So just to sort of formalize what I just described in the picture. So ONB plus is just D plus one vector in D dimension where the D vector are on orthonormal basis and I just repeat any one of the vector. Now, when I put ET, ETFD, it just means like uh, the simplest ETF in D dimension. So D plus one vector in D dimension. And what I call a lifted ETF from RK to RD is that I'll take the ETF of uh, K plus one vector in dimension K, and I'm going to append to that like uh, the identity matrix in the missing dimension. That's what sort of a lifting process is. So that's how I generate each of these new family that are appearing here was I just lifted version of, of the ETF that I have from the lower dimension as I keep going. So with this notation and uh, the value of the point where the, the minimizer is changing is given by this, uh, this value here. Uh, Zoo and Zoo prove like uh, the paper just got, uh, ac oh, no, was accepted maybe last year and uh, was posted on uh, the website of ACHA this, uh, earlier this year. Um, they proved that uh, the configuration that I just described, uh, orthonormal basis plus, is a unique minimizer between zero and P1. 
And between each of the PK minus one and PK, the lifted ETF from dimension K to dimension K plus one is a unique minimizer. And then from PD, the very last point, all the way to infinity, the minimizer is exactly the simplest ETF in D dimension. So this is again like an example where this uh, nice somehow um, uh, configuration provide actually a single solution to this optimization problem. So they are universal in this sense. Uh, there's something interesting happening here. They seem to sort of be like uh, a sort of phase transition about two. So be before two, the minimizer are somehow like just things that sort of come from an orthonormal basis more or less or a lifting version of, uh, of uh, some of these uh, um, ATF from lower dimension. And starting from two, we get something that sort of uh, more like cover ETF. So this phenomenon that we're observing that in some range lo lower, less or equal to two, uh, we seem to have a phenomenal basis. And in P bigger than two, we seem to have something else. It's something that's going to appear a little bit more and that I'm going to talk about in a, in a little bit. So just to sort of uh, provide like more about this ONB plus, and that was exactly what I was, I was trying to mention. So Glazren and Josiah Park actually proved like a very interesting result that this minimizer like having like ONB plus. So in particular, when I mean ONB plus, it could be like two copies of an orthonormal basis plus a few repeated vector. So they prove that when P is between zero and two, this happened quite a lot. And in particular in dimension two, for every N greater or equal to four, they were able to prove that from zero to about 1.3, the minimizer are exactly like uh, copies of an orthonormal basis and then repeated vector to sort of make up for uh, the number of points that you have in the, in the system. Uh, I'm going to come back to this a little bit later because I believe like, uh, so for instance, for n equal to four, I know that this has to be the case from zero to two. And uh, for n equal to five and uh, beyond, we think like you can actually push this a little bit closer to two than 1.3. I'm going to sh talk about some of the numerical results that we, we, we seem to be having uh, in a little bit. But to go back to the connection to the continuous potential, I would like to point out to this result that Martin and I, we proved in 2012, which says that in fact, if you look at the continuous frame, uh, P frame potential, you're minimizing over the, the probability measure in, uh, uh, on uh, the unit here in D dimension, as long as P is between zero and two, all the minimizers are discrete measures. And in fact, they are discrete measures where the support is essentially coming from an orthonormal basis. And so we have a more precise result, but this thing where that sort of saying that before two, it seemed like orthonormal basis or somehow like a copy of it is dominating, is also something that's happening in, uh, in, uh, in dimension, uh, sorry, for the continuous frame potential. And uh, the recent result that, uh, Dimitri uh, Bilik and his collaborator got was an extension somehow of this result or a more general version of this result where between any two consecutive like uh, even integer they were able to prove that when some uh, some uh, T design exists then they're going to provide the unique minimizer and therefore they're going to sort of be discrete so this seems to be something that sort of happened a lot more than just in this single case that I'm highlighting here and that was the basis of a conjecture that the minimizer of the p-frame potential, except at the even point where at the even integer, you can actually have like surface measure being like a minimizer, except those situations, the minimizer are always going to be discrete measures. All right, so now what I'd like to do is uh, talk a little bit more about the case. So in two dim in three dimension, or sorry, in two dimension, I know the Mercedes-Benz is an ETF, which is uh, a simplest ETF. In dimension D, if I have D plus one point, I know I can do the same thing. I, we just give a complete characterization of the minimizer. We notice that there exists this family that form like very nice uh, universal minimizer. But what happens when you start sort of playing with, uh, uh, keep the dimension fixed, but increase the number of points. So the first instance of that is what happened when you work in dimension two, but uh, ask yourself what happened if I take four or more points. So in that case, uh, Mar uh, uh, Martin and I, we prove that between zero and two, uh, just two copy of an orthonormal basis will provide the minimizer. And um, in the work with uh, Shuji, uh, um, uh, Shumei, Victor, and Eric, 
we actually proved that for p bigger than two of the four point that of uh, when you take like four point equally space on the upper half plane, they provide exactly the unique set of minimizer for this potential. So how come uh, for this four point came about? Uh, John and Kortza, um, uh, I think in 2003 or five, I believe, uh, constructed like uh, the Grassmannian frame for all n in two dimension essentially. And this is the Grassmannian of four vector in dimension two. So you have a minimizer at p equal infinity. And what we prove is that that minimizer is actually the unique minimizer all the way to p equal to two. And at two, you get two copy of an orthonormal basis that become a, uh, a minimizer all the way to zero. So again, we have here a universal family of the Grassmannian frame in two dimension with four vector provide such a thing that give me a minimizer for this entire family of, uh, of P. So the result is, um, was quite interesting because we, we actually sort of uh, look at Cohn and Kuma paper and uh, we start like uh, the main tool in the paper, which is uh, the theorem that I'm stating here. So the theorem says that if I have a decreasing function and I take any four point equally space on, on a circle of a given radius, then uh, that will prov provide uh, exactly the optimal configuration for a minimizer of uh, this family. So this is actually more optimal than, oh, sorry, more universal than just the p-frame potential for any function that's decreasing and converse, then this four point equally space on any sphere or circle in dimension two will give me the optimal uh, configuration. And if the function is strictly converse, then this is going to be actually unique. So when you go to five and more points, then things work the same, uh, except that uh, we don't know anymore whether or not we can bring the Grassmannian all the way from infinity to two, as we've done in, in for four point, but we can bring it as close as we want to two, uh, depending on uh, a threshold and the threshold is provided here. So for n greater equal to five, this set of points is a unique minimizer of a p-frame potential in two dimension. Um, for all p greater than two n minus two when n is even and uh, two n minus four when n is odd. And uh, between uh, two and uh, this threshold, at any even integer there, we can also prove that this thing are uh, 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 optimal but we no longer can prove that this thing are uh, actually unique. And I think this are the regime where you can sort of think that uh, there could be like a some spherical design that could also sort of provide you with, uh, with optimal set. So I'm not going to go through any proof, but uh, I'm going to sort of highlight what's, uh, what's known now. So in this picture, uh, between zero and two, uh, we don't know too much. I mentioned a little bit earlier. So this graph is a minimizer with five points. I mentioned uh, the result by uh, Alexei Glazrin and uh, Josia Park that says between zero and 1.3 of the minimizer is exactly like uh, two copies of an orthonormal basis plus one repeated vector. But between 1.3 and two, we don't know too much about what the minimum is. And between uh, two and uh, six, we actually don't know. So I'll mention something about this case in a little bit uh, with some work that we're doing with uh, Shuji Kang. Uh, for six, we know that between zero and two, the minimizer is exactly three copy of an orthonormal basis. The result that I just stated give us a minimum, the minimum after 10, and uh, that's exactly like the Grassmannian frame of a C vector in two dimension. At all the even integer between those two, we know it, and uh, we can use some result by uh, Bilik and his collaborator to close the gap between two and four. So right now, in this particular case, uh, the unknown case, uh, what happened between four and, six and 10, except the even integers. So I'm talking about just four or five points, and I have a, a potential that seems pretty nice. And um, it seems like uh, from what I've known or all the known method that I can think of, we cannot establish whether or not uh, what we suspect to be the minimizer is actually the minimizer. So that's an interesting thing that I'm hoping uh, maybe somebody can sort of uh, take up a challenge to do this, uh, maybe uh, against a beer or something else. I don't know what we can offer in this case. So Dustin will let me know what he thinks. So the result again is, uh, is actually just a special case of a more general result that we prove. And uh, it was inspired by the work of Kohn and Kuma. And this is a version of the result. So you can think about this as uh, trying to do like uh, linear programming bound and uh, we push it as low 
as we can. And uh, beyond this thing, I don't think the linear programming bound will work anymore. You'll have to find a different method to sort of uh, try to find your minimizer in this rank. So I'm not going to go through it, but uh, this is actually the, the heart of, uh, of uh, our paper. This is uh, the main result that sort of uh, provide as a corollary, as a corollary, the result that I just mentioned. So I have a few more uh, cases that I want to highlight, like uh, uh, when n is greater or equal to six and uh, is even, we can do something based on a recent work by uh, Dimitri uh, Bilik and his collaborators. And this is uh, what I just mentioned in the graph earlier. So I want to sort of uh, focus a little bit more on the case of five point. And something very interesting that we've, ob we've been observing numerically that we cannot sort of prove. And uh, this will sort of uh, take me toward the end of, uh, of the presentation. So we'll have plenty of time for, for questions if, uh, if you guys want to ask more questions. So in this case, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's known now that up to 1.3, the minimizer is uh, for two copy of an orthonormal basis plus one repeated vector. And numerically, we can actually prove that you can push that to a value that's close to 1.8. I'll give you the exact numerical value that we've seen to sort of be having. But then at that point, you have a new minimizer and the minimizer will go all the way to two. And starting from two, we think like uh, the, uh, the Grassmannian of five vector in two dimensions should be the minimizer. And so what seems to sort of be happening is that uh, we think like uh, for P bigger than 3.1, the minimizer should always be a tight crank. Uh, uh, we have not been able to completely establish this, but if we know how to establish this, uh, we're hoping to use like a classic of a parametrization of a tight frame of a two vector, or sorry, five vector in two dimension by Nate, Dustin, and uh, all, the, all the team to see if we can rewrite the potential in a different sort of domain. And uh, that's going to allow us to sort of do the minimization easily. But that's a program that we haven't sort of been able to complete so far, but that's where we, we're heading. So for sure, uh, it's known that the minimizer all the way to 1.3 is, uh, is uh, a copy, two copy of an orthonormal basis plus one repeated vector. We think that should be the case all the way to 1.78. And between 1.78 and two, We've been numerically getting like a frame that have a form X, X, Y, Y, Z. So in other words, it seemed like to be like a basis repeated twice and then plus one extra vector that has nothing to do with uh, the other, or not nothing to do, but is not, not none of these vectors. So that's an interesting thing. And exactly at the value 1.78, uh, you can show that there exists uh, a tight frame of this form that will become a minimizer all the way to two. And starting at two, you're going to get like a five vector uh, uh, Grassmannian frame to become a minimizer. So this, we've seen it like a lot numerically. And this is what uh, uh, Radel and myself, we've been sort of looking at. So he has like a lot of code to do this optimization and um, for different value of uh, N and var various value of P, we have like a candidate for what the minimizer should be. But the question is, we, we, we don't know how to prove this statement yet. So I want to leave you with uh, some open question things that I'm hoping one can sort of do. So completing the case five and six seem to me like uh, what one should be able to sort of do. I don't know how to do it. We've been pushing this a lot, but uh, so far we haven't been able to sort of get a complete picture. Uh, the linear programming uh, bound in this case doesn't work. So we'll have to sort of find a different way to sort of uh, look at this problem. Uh, when n is uh, odd and uh, we less than two, it seems like that's the most interesting case. It seems like there could be many points where the minimizer will sort of change. And uh, that's something we haven't sort of completely been able to sort of settle. Uh, in three dimension with uh, five or six vectors, uh, we know Grassmannian frame of this uh, type. And the question is, can we do the same analysis? Now, the reason we were able to do it in two dimension was that, um, there exists a list of all these uh, sharp configuration that I mentioned. And in two dimension, we know exactly what they are. So we reduce essentially the problem for P equal to two to checking whether or not this sharp configuration fall into the theory that Kuma and Kohn described. And for dimension three, uh, these things are not sharp configuration. So it's not clear to us how to sort of uh, look at uh, 
uh, rework this uh, this uh, theory of Kohn and Kuma to to get anything. But I suspect that this should be the minimizer, like the Grassmannian frame in or with this many vector should sort of be the minimizer all the way to a certain value of p. And the question is, what's that value of p? How do we find it? And what happens when you below that value? That will be very interesting. I believe this will sort of uh, indicate whether or not this Grassmannian frame, um, how useful they are. Uh, I believe recently, uh, Dustin and uh, Hans, they look at a Grassmannian of a six vector in four dimension, uh, six four. And uh, my question will be the same. As long as you can put your hand on one of these objects, which is a minimizer for infinity, can you actually sort of show that you can push it all the way to a given value of p and what that value of p and what happened below that, that value of p? So that's, uh, that's a question that I would I would like to sort of um, keep thinking about. And uh, there's a list of these non sharp configuration. They seem to sort of be like minimizer for at infinity. Can you actually sort of push it down to sort of uh, see that the, the minimizer for the p-frame potential? Uh, as we've shown, uh, the result that we obtain apply for larger class of potential than just the p-frame potential. So it might be interesting to look at this question in this case. And uh, Bilic and uh, all uh, conjecture is a very interesting one. Uh, when we're looking at uh, the probabilistic frame potential, we never actually sort of thought about what would happen for p bigger than two, but they seem to sort of be pointing to the case that all the minimizer except at this even number where they sort of is a transition, then we should all get sort of discrete measure. So it will be interesting to see if whether or not any of these problems have a solution. So that's, um, that's what I was hoping to talk about. Uh, uh, the two cases, I already mentioned this, uh, the open problem, and uh, these are some of the references. So you can sort of get some of them on my, on my website. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I hope uh, we can discuss a little bit more if you have any question. I didn't give any proof, but I can sort of get into some of the detail now if you want to. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. There's a reaction icons available to you if you'd like to applaud and I will stop the recording. <laughs>